As the second reactor experiences a potential meltdown in Japan, fears of a nuclear fallout grow. Now, 22 people have already been exposed to radiation, and nearly 200,000 people are being evacuated as radiation levels appear to be rising. It certainly isn't a, a, a global level of violence that would normally merit uh, intervention. But some Western states paint a different picture of the situation in Libya, calling for a no-fly zone and seeking possible military intervention. Will we investigate the real situation in the country? And lifting the reset to new heights, the U.S. Vice President visits Moscow, backing the bid for Russia's World Trade Organization membership. Coming to you live from our studios in Moscow, you're watching RT. Thanks for joining us. Now, there have been reports that the second reactor at Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant is experiencing a partial meltdown. It comes just a day after a powerful blast rocked another reactor at the site following the failure of cooling systems caused by Friday's massive earthquake. Well, the number of people admitted to hospitals suffering exposure to radiation is said to be rising amid a series of aftershocks that continue to shake the country. Well, RT's Ivor Bennett has the latest from Tokyo. Actually, the city is still shaking. There have been a number of aftershocks just this morning, even. Uh, one, the last one about 20 minutes ago. The whole room was shaking as I walk uh, downstairs. The light fittings were shaking, and it's very hard to actually walk in a straight line. You're swaying. Uh, and in, during the night, there were a couple of aftershocks so strong, in fact, that it woke me up, and I could actually hear the room creaking and things uh, falling from the roof outside. Uh, so the city is still experiencing aftershocks, none that are actually inflicting damage on the city and, uh, and from what I've seen that there's very little surface damage here but the transport infrastructure is definitely still suffering I mean trying to arrange transport uh, now to Sendai to the epicenter uh, where the, the earthquake hit two days ago but um, all the trains none of the trains going to the north of the country they're not working uh, and they're still very unsure of uh, what actual transport links they can run with all these aftershocks still happening. So even as far away as Tokyo, still suffering the after effects. Local authorities fear that a number of the people who have been affected by the radiation that has spilled out into the atmosphere could actually rise to 160 as they actually now uh, analyze the exposure of the people who have been evacuated from the area around the uh, Fukushima number no. one power plant where the a number of reactors are still on high alert. Yesterday, one of the reactors exploded. Uh, Authorities are playing down the fears of nuclear meltdown. However, they're still on high alert a number of other reactors at that Fukushima number one plant and number two plant now uh, because the pressure is still very, very uh, high inside a number of the reactors and they're having to re let out steam and obviously in doing so radiation too, and which is building to the radiation in the atmosphere. And also the cooling system actually on one of the reactors at that second plant was knocked out again this morning. And with the other plant, with the other reactors whose cooling function is not working, they're actually using pumping in seawater even to around the reactor to try and cool it. And they've evacuated 200,000 people and they're handing out iodine uh, to these people who have coming out of those affected areas because that's what's used to treat uh, radiation exposure. Well, Russia is closely monitoring the radiation on its territory closest to Japan. And Moscow also says it's ready to help Tokyo, with Russia having ha vast experience in dealing with both natural and man-made disasters. RT's Natalia Novikova now joins us live from the capital for more. Now, Natalia, at this point, uh, wh what can Russia do to help Japan? Well, Russia, among 45 nations worldwide, is on is on standby to send its help uh, to the shattered country. Uh, so far, uh, Prime Minister Putin has said that Russia is ready to send fuel and double gas supplies to Japan if uh, such, uh, if Japan Japan requests. Uh, that from Russia. Also 200 doctors, rescuers and psychologists are ready to go and um, help the citizens that have 
uh, suffered in uh, the earthquake. Um, also, 14 units of hardware are on standby, including seven uh, jets. Uh, Russia is ready to help Japan, but what is needed now from Japan is an official request. So far, Japan has accepted help from six countries, including the United States, Great Britain, Germany, Australia, New Zealand, and South Korea. Meanwhile, here in the Russian capital, people are coming to the Japanese embassy and laying flowers by its walls. Okay, well, we know that uh, Russia has been on high alert, especially because the Far East is very close to the uh, center, the epicenter, the nuclear power plant. Well, ha just how has the situation in the Russia's Far East been affected by the, what's happening in Japan? Well, a Russian Atomic uh, Energy Agency has assured that in the worst case scenario of emission of uh, radioactive particles, they will not reach Russia's shores. One of the explanations of that could be the fact that the air flows around the globe move in such a way. They move from west to east and from north uh, to south. So if you look at the map, uh, in the worst case scenario, the particles would be uh, carried away from Japan and Russia towards uh, the Pacific Ocean. Having said that, Russia does have the set experience of dealing with consequences of uh, a nuclear disaster so uh, back in 1986 in Chernobyl so in the worst case scenario Russia is ready to help Japan in that respect as well okay well thank you very much for that update artist Natalia Novikova reporting there from Moscow well, our correspondent in Ukraine, Alexei Yaroshevsky, looks at the similarities of the Chernobyl disaster with what's happening right now in Japan Obviously, this white smoke coming from the reactor building is the only obvious resemblance which we can see between the two incidents 25 years ago in Chernobyl and at the Fukushima power plant uh, nowadays. Um, that's where the similarities end. The situations are basically different uh, simply because what uh, caused the uh, what caused them, you know, the uh, the fallout in Chernobyl was caused by a massive human error. What is happening now in Japan is, of course, a result of a natural disaster after the um, earthquake happened, which happened on Friday. And um, the other big difference, and this is a very significant difference between the two events, is uh, how uh, the government has been responding to, uh, the, uh, to the events. Obviously, 25 years ago, uh, the uh, government, the Soviet government, kept most of the information secret from uh, the general population in Russia as well as from the rest of the world. Uh, it went on a, a massive uh, secret campaign to just uh, safeguard this information. And uh, this was, uh, this is something which we cannot see today because the Japanese government, even though we have conflicting reports coming from uh, the island of uh, what's happening there and we have no certainty of uh, what caused this blast, still uh, the Japanese government ordered the evacuation of people from the surrounding areas uh, at uh, the uh, Fukushima region. Uh, this didn't happen 25 years ago when uh, 50 odd thousand residents of the town of Pripyat next to the Chernobyl power plant uh, were uh, kept in the town for more than 24 hours and this of course caused uh, some damage to them. The people were subjected to a great deal of radioactive threat coming from the open reactor. Spare no effort in getting the job done. This typical motto for construction projects in the Soviet Union also applied to the Chernobyl nuclear power plant when construction kicked off in the 1970s. It was intended to be a dream project for Soviet Ukraine. The birth rate in Pripyat was higher than all of Ukraine. People were given homes and there was a great demand for a workforce in Chernobyl. So everyone worked and liked it there. But this happy existence came to an abrupt end on April the 26, 1986, with the explosion of a reactor at the power station. The quantity of the transuranium element americium-241 has been growing since the Chernobyl disaster. It's increased by 50 or 60 percent. It might increase 40 times by 2056. The very same motto used for building the plants, spare no effort, was now to be used in the clear-up of the world's worst ever man-made nuclear disasters. The blazing reactor was bombarded with sand and lead, measures which at first seemed panic-driven, but which were later deemed highly effective by the International Atomic Energy Agency. 
This action helped to contain the radiation and enable construction of the sarcophagus, a structure built around the reactor to seal it off for several months after the catastrophe. We repaired the shelter roof, we stabilized the western area, the most risky one from the point of view of stability. Uh, these very structures, they were uh, stabilized for the term not less than 15 years. The Soviet Union came under severe criticism afterwards for both the operation of the plant and employment of unqualified staff and concealment of news of disaster from the rest of the world. The lessons of Chernobyl have been learned by experts worldwide since the catastrophe and will have been of assistance to those battling the latest serious nuclear accident in Japan, threatening contamination with large numbers of people being evacuated because of the radiation threat, something which didn't happen 25 years ago in Soviet Ukraine. The Chernobyl fallout was caused by a massive human error. Mistakes made by the authorities in the first hours after the blast also cost many lives. But the events of 25 years ago in what is now sovereign Ukraine have proved to be an invaluable lesson for mankind. Alexei Roshevsky, RT, reporting from Kiev, Ukraine. An anti-nuclear expert, Dr. Zante Hall, says that although a Chernobyl-type disaster is unlikely to happen in Japan, the contamination area from the Fukushima plant will grow. It seems a, a horrible irony that the Japanese, who were the first to be attacked with the nuclear weapons, would now also suffer from the hands of nuclear energy. We hope that it, it won't be like Chernobyl in terms of how wide it will be spread, because if it was an explosion coming out of a containment dome, then it won't go as high as it did by, with Chernobyl, and so uh, it won't spread so far. But that means that the radiation will be a lot more intense in the actual area. So it's good that they're evacuating at the moment, but it's really not enough because the area is much larger that we're talking about that will be contaminated. Christopher Simons, an associate professor at a Tokyo university, says that not everyone will be able to escape radiation exposure. Difference between um, the type of material being vented uh, um, here at, at, at Daiichi, it, it, it is mostly steam. Um, in Chernobyl, um, these uh, the vaporized graphite uh, would have materialized as, as dust or, or affected people as dust. So staying inside uh, would have been uh, the, the best option. The same uh, applies to Daiichi, but of course, um, if the water condenses and enters the water supply, um, it will make it undrinkable. Uh, so people wearing masks, uh, keeping their doors and windows shut, and keeping their air circulation systems, such as heating and air conditioners, switched off is, is about all you can do. I mean, uh, uh, the government has, has, has given excellent advice in, in that situation. There really isn't anything else you can do. Uh, the, the military and the firefighters who, who are uh, in the vicinity working on this problem are certainly specially trained to deal with this kind of emergency. Uh, so there simply seem to be uh, two options. One is to continue uh, trying to deliver water to that reactor core, uh, and the second is simply to, to evacuate as many people as possible. So obviously, uh, unfortunately, the emergency workers in the vicinity uh, will be receiving uh, quite dangerous levels of radiation. Um, at this point, the, 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 the best thing that the public can do or the government can do for the public is to move people as far away as possible. Well, do stay with RT throughout the day as we keep you abreast of all the latest developments in Japan. Well, turning now to Libya, the Arab League has backed the idea of a no-fly zone over the country. After an emergency summit, member states agreed to ask the UN Security Council to impose the restrictions suggested by the UK and France. But as RT's Paula Slea reports, the actual situation there in Libya is far from the way it's being presented. There's a lot more haggling on the international stage over the merits of intervention and a no-fly zone than the bargaining taking place in downtown Tripoli Market. Shops here close early nowadays, people are afraid, and many of the Africans who used to work here have fled the country. And the argument that Libya is on the brink of civil war, so foreign intervention is needed, seems to ring a little hollow. 
There have been several hundred people killed, but that's not a huge level of violence. It certainly isn't a, a, a global level of violence that would normally merit uh, intervention. Gaddafi has offered access to foreign media, but only if the camera lenses stay well away from any of the opposition. But it's a similar picture in the opposition strongholds. Dr. Ramadan Breki was forced to close the Benghazi office of his newspaper because of pressure from rebels. You have to print their version of events, he says, or nothing. The, the media uh, uh, is going to the hot places and all th these cities are controlled by the rebels and the independent people, they are afraid, they cannot tell the news what they think and what they believe. So. And many Gaddafi supporters fear that while he may be winning the war with the rebels, he's losing the information war. Like here in Janzu, outside Tripoli, where schoolgirl Mona says she's puzzled and angry by reports that mercenaries were shooting people in her town. It's normal. Teachers come and we get the lessons, we, we write homework, normal, normal life. And life certainly seems calm on the streets. As for conflicts elsewhere, where the death count is climbing, there's little media coverage and even less foreign interest to intervene. There are events unfolding right now in Ivory Coast, uh, where there is also a conflict, an armed conflict between rebels and the government. But nobody seems to be thinking of that. Uh, it's only because fashionable attention is focused on Libya. The only reason they're interested in, with Libya is about the oil. You'd think we'd be in Iraq if the major export there was broccoli. So as leaders meet in Brussels to discuss the fate of a country hundreds of miles away, many Libyans are saying it's their mess and they'll clean it up. Policia RT, Janzo. Anti-war columnist and historian Nebosha Malic from Washington, D.C. believes that there's absolutely no justification for anyone to meddle in Libya's affairs. This is reminding me every day more of uh, Bosnia in the early 1990s when uh, a, a clear-cut case for intervention couldn't be made and the public was not very much in a mood for war, so one had to be uh, sort of created gradually by gradual involvement, and it started with a, uh, you know, humanitarian of agents and observers and uh, scouting missions, and it continued through the no-fly zone, and uh, it ended up being full-blown war several years later. Uh, right now, um, invoking the, the responsibility to protect doctrine is basically going to make it obvious to the entire world that this is a license to meddle doctrine. Uh, there's absolutely no uh, possible justification for the United States or even the EU to get involved in Libya. There, there, there's just nothing in their charters or uh, just there, there's nothing that would justify this. Well, Rob Lienz, the deputy editor of Spiked magazine in London, says that even the talk of foreign intervention is affecting the situation on the ground in Libya. There is actually a bit of competition going on between the major Western powers about who can, see to, who can be seen to be the most kind of moral, the most ethical on the world stage. So France at the moment is really, it, it seems to be driving things at the moment, but then the British Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary have been talking up the, the possibility of intervention as well. And usually these things are a sign of, of, of things not going well for politicians at home, that they, they want to try and find some, uh, some story, some issue on the world stage that can provide a bit of uh, a distraction, provide them with a sense of, they, they've got some sense of purpose, which is lacking in the domestic sphere. So I, th I wouldn't think too much about the, the oil situation. What I do think, though, is that even the sabre rattling is going to have a very b bad effect on uh, events on the ground in Libya. I mean, just the possibility of intervention will, will for one, on one hand, mean that Gaddafi is going to have to uh, work much faster to try and uh, end the uprising before that, that possibility arises. And on the other hand, the rebels will now be looking abroad for, um, f to, to try and resolve this conflict, rather than looking to their own uh, ability to, uh, to, to, to win this uh, situation. And I think that's a very, very bad sign as well. I think that's going to make a, a, a mess, regardless of it, even if one shot is fired from, 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 from the West. The possibility of it happening is already distorting things on the ground. Later this hour, RT talks to Russia's envoy to NATO, Dmitry Ragozin. He says certain countries are pushing to get involved in Libya because they are reliant on its oil resources. I think if Libya were just a banana growing country, there wouldn't be so much interest in its domestic situation, including in the humanitarian sphere. Of course, Libya is a big enough energy supplier to Europe. Certain countries, like Italy, for example, are heavily dependent on Libyan deliveries. 
others are not so much dependent, but either way, Libya's share is considerable. We know that NATO, for example, puts energy security matters at the top of its main agenda. For this reason, I think that this factor has a most direct bearing on the speed of the West's decision-making regarding Libya. The U.S. vice president was in high spirits when he arrived on a two-day visit to Moscow earlier this week. While his main goal was to encourage the continued reset between the two countries, while Libya understandably made it into the discussions, the majority of the visit was focused on boosting trade. The talks may have been on serious Beautiful. issues, but the mood was certainly light. Well, Dmitry Medvedev joked with Joe Biden that he hopes the U.S. vice president won't be working on Russia's bid for WTO membership all the way to the end of his career. Well, the Russian leader was promised that Washington is doing all it can to make the accession happen. Democratic strategist Chris Lapetina says the U.S. needs Russia's support, and this visit highlights that. I think that the existing relations are on a track uh, to moving forward, no matter what the little disruptions are. And I, and I think that's very important. And I think that's part of what uh, Biden's trip is all about and then Obama's trip will be all about, which is even if we have setbacks along the way, the message has to be very clear to the Russian people and to the American people that Russia and the United States now have more in common than we do, we, we do that separates us. We need Russia to be part of the WTO. We need a free trade with Russia. I, I think that that, that message is being uh, sent to anything the United States does, uh, it will clearly uh, take into account how the uh, Russian government, uh, the Russian leadership feels about things. And I'm sure that uh, Vice President Biden is making that very clear to uh, to the Russian leadership that uh, no, whatever we do in Libya, we're going to try to make sure that we cooperate with you and we're not in conflict with you. The other thing, of course, is we're coming up to the 10th anniversary of 9-11. I don't think it's lost on the American people that uh, the Russian people have been uh, victimized by Islamic terrorists, and we share that in common. And I think the metaphor for that is this idea of a missile defense. Although it's aimed at uh, states like Iran and others, uh, I think that it's a symbol that we stand united against against terrorists, and, and that's another thing. So while we might disagree on things like Libya, I think going forward, the relationship moves forward no matter what the little setbacks might be. Well, let's get more on other international news making the headlines this hour. Six people have been killed and hundreds injured in violent clashes between police and anti-government protesters in Yemen. The authorities stormed a makeshift camp of thousands of demonstrators in the capital, and they used live bullets, tear gas, and water cannons to disperse the crowd. The protesters responded with a hail of rocks and live ammunition. The demonstrators have been camping in the area for weeks, demanding the end of President Ali Abdullah Saleh's 32-year rule. A horrific tour bus accident in New York has claimed the lives of 15 people and seriously injured another 10. The coach was carrying at least 31 passengers when it flipped over, slid on its side and hit a pole. That pole sliced the bus in half along the windows, tearing the rooftop off the vehicle. The driver told investigators he swerved to avoid a tractor trailer, but witnesses claimed the bus had been traveling at high speed. The vehicle was returning from a casino outside the city. The Israeli army has sealed off an area in the West Bank as police search for the killer of a Jewish couple and three of their children. The family were stabbed to death in their home. But the Israeli army has declared the area a closed military zone. Israeli forces have set up checkpoints in the area and have restricted the movement of civilians. The incident comes as Israeli-Palestinian peace efforts have ground to a halt. Well, earlier this week, Russia's Republic of Chechnya hosted an all-star match, widely seen as a major step forward for the region. A team of Brazilian football veterans arrived for a charity game against a team captained by Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov. RT's Tom Barton explores how a former arena for military conflict is leaving its bloody past behind and showing a new side, all thanks to sport. It must rank as one of the more curious fixtures in football history. At a press conference late the night before, Chechnya's leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, spoke of his excitement at the arrival of the opposition. It's a real holiday for all our fans who have been waiting for this event for such a long time. It's an exciting day and I know that many of those who left the Republic years ago are coming back to enjoy the match. 
but many reporters there doubted a team of Brazilian veterans would really come to play in Chechnya. The next day, we were greeted at the airport by a sea of Che Guevara-style Kadyrov faces and shouting supporters. Walking into this cult-like scene came the Brazilian team, looking a little bemused. The Chechens, however, were ecstatic. I can't believe this is happening. We couldn't even dream of an event like this happening before. I've come to Grozny especially for this match, and I think it will erase the sad memories of the past, and everything will be great. Five years ago, this match would have been unthinkable. Grozny was in ruins after two military campaigns from the mid-1990s following an insurgency. It was in this very stadium that Ramzan Kadyrov's father was blown up a decade before. The area is still subject to high levels of security against the threat of terrorism as it moved towards normality after years of conflict, since which Grozny has come a long way. Things change every day. We see new facilities being built and people understand that they have to forget the past and live on. Come kickoff time, the stadium was bursting at the seams. Brazil scored an easy first goal, followed by repeated attempts by the Chechens to get one back. Who knows what was said in the changing room, but Kadyrov had made sure he was the centre of attention. Despite missing two penalties, he eventually managed to get himself on the score sheet. The game ended 6-4 to Brazil. It was a very disappointing score, but what can we do? A game is a game. We wanted to win, but we lost. The Brazilians have shown again that the Brazilian team is the strongest in the world today. They were keen to stress they were only here for charity. Their visit saw Chechnya make world headlines again, but this time for sport and fun. It'll take more than just a football match to chase the spectre of war and terrorism away from Chechnya and the North Caucasus. But for now, in the spirit of friendly competition, everyone here agrees it's a step or a kick in the right direction. Tom Barton, RT, Chechnya. Well, you're watching RT live from Moscow, and I'll be back with you shortly with the headlines.